Pope Frankie is running his mouth about libertarianism from his gilded throne of socialism. What's in the news with stories on court sentencing software, tortured to death in jail, the federal drug war, and no more Fifth Amendment. Also, how to live in a lava lifestyle on Praxis and a herding cats with your chance to win two free tickets to Porkfest. This episode is brought to you by Praxis, where you can get a full-time job in nine months, making $50,000 a year with no college degree. Welcome to The Lava Flow, channeling the flow of information to the libertarian, anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, and agorist community. Find us at thelavaflow.com. Here's your host, Roger Paxton. Thank you for joining me this week. Coming to you from the state that is the home of the smallest horse ever born, Einstein, weighing in at only six pounds and only 14 inches tall. This is the show that will bring you the people, places, and events that everyone in the Liberty Revolution needs to know. You can catch me on Twitter at the Lava Flow Pod. This is episode 61 Pope Frankie Hates Libertarians, and it's Tuesday, May 9th, 2017 when there have already been more than 410 people killed by police this year. What's wrestling my jimmies this week? You're about to find out. Let's do it to it. Pope Francis has apparently decided that sitting on his gilded throne and sticking to religion is not really his thing. Of course, he's always been that way, decrying capitalism and the free market every chance he gets. He can do this since he has a skewed version of the world where, to make money, all he has to do is tell people that they either have to give to his church or they go to hell. No market incentives here, just make-believe, fraud, and lies. And the church can even sell sacraments and influence, and they do it. It's more like organized crime than a free market company. And I know this may offend some of my listeners, including a supporter of this show and a very close personal friend of mine who's Catholic. That's not my intention. My intention is to call out moronic behavior when it appears and point out the hypocrisy involved in these behaviors. I understand that church participation is voluntary, and I would never take that away from anyone, least of all my incredible mother who's a devout Christian. But keep in mind, giving in to the incentives of organized crime protecting your business for your payment is also voluntary. This time, Pope Franny talks about libertarianism, and he's apparently not a big fan. Now, to be clear, there is some controversy over the Italian words that he used in this speech, and if those words actually mean libertarian at all, as you and I know the word. However, his sentiment and his description of what he takes issue with do sound very much like libertarianism. Pope Frankie said, quote, I cannot fail to speak of the grave risks associated with the invasion of the positions of libertarian individualism at high strata of culture and in school and university education. A common characteristic of this fallacious paradigm is that it minimizes the common good, that is the idea of living well or the good life in the communitarian framework. Now, to me, it sounds pretty much like he's talking about the individualism that libertarianism is all about. He goes on to say that libertarianism, quote, which is so fashionable today, is a more radical form of the individualism that asserts that only the individual gives value to things and to interpersonal relations, and therefore only the individual decides what is good and what is evil. First of all, I wish libertarianism were as fashionable as Frank thinks it is. But let's be honest, it's not yet. We've made lots of progress the last decade or so, but we still have a very long road ahead of us if we're going to achieve liberty in our lifetimes. But let's take a look at what he says here. Only the individual gives value to things and to interpersonal relationships. Well, of course that's true. There's no such thing as a collective mind in humanity. This is not Borg. While many individuals can share things like culture or family or other collective ideas, there's no requirement or law of nature that forces that on anyone. This idea of collectivism is evil. It is egalitarian in nature and very much socialist at its roots. Frankie Boy goes on to say, quote, Thus the libertarian individual denies the value of the common good, because on the one hand he supposes that the very idea of common means the constriction of at least some individuals, and on the other hand that the notion of good deprives freedom of its essence. Libertarianism, he continued, is an antisocial radicalization of individualism, which, quote, leads to the conclusion that everyone has the right to extend himself as far as his abilities allow him, even at the cost of the exclusion and marginalization of the more vulnerable majority. 
According to this mentality, all relationships that create ties must be eliminated, the Pope suggested, quote, since they would limit freedom. In this way, only by living independently of others, of the common good, and even God himself, can a person be free, he said. Now, that's what he honestly thinks that libertarianism is all about. Now, let's be honest. Libertarianism does celebrate the individual and individualism, but it does not in any way ask for relationship ties to be eliminated. That's just utter nonsense. Now, I do know of one person who, at least at one time, called himself a libertarianism and is now a Trump supporter who talks about defooing yourself from family and friends. But let's be clear. That guy's a fucking moron, and he is not indicative of what libertarians believe. I will say that personally, one of the most freeing moments of my life was when I shook off the shackles of religion. Now, that may not be the case for everybody, and I get that, but that is just further proof of the individualism of libertarianism at work. I have Christian, both Protestant and Catholic, libertarian friends. I have Muslim libertarian friends. I have Jewish and atheist libertarian friends. I have deist and Buddhist libertarian friends. And you know what? Because of our individuality, not our collectivism, are we friends. Because we can think independently and come to conclusions about the world on our own, it gives us the ability to respect the diversity that makes us all human. Now, this does not mean that we have to respect all ideas. As libertarians, we have to respect that people do have their own ideas, but that does not mean that I have to respect those ideas. I don't respect the ideas of Pope Fuckstick but I do respect his ability to sit on his gilded throne and throw words around that have no basis in reality. Because he has that ability, I also have the ability to say fuck him in the neck. Socialism looks rather grand to him on his high throne and his high horse, but to the average person who is giving billions of dollars to the Catholic Church around the world, socialism and egalitarianism are only repressing them. Have you subscribed to the Lava Flow on iTunes or any mobile device yet? Then what's wrong with you? Go to thelavaflow.com slash subscribe so you don't miss a minute of the show. And while you're subscribing, make sure to leave me a five-star rating and review the show to help others find our podcast. Thelavaflow.com slash subscribe. What's in the news? The news you need to know from a libertarian perspective. In computer courts news, a man was sentenced to six years in prison, in part due to a secret algorithm in a piece of software. Eric J. Loomis was convicted of eluding an officer while driving a car that had been used in a shooting back in 2013. After his conviction, the judge in the Wisconsin case used a piece of software called Compass that gave him a rating on the proprietary software scale that suggested he was at risk of committing another crime. Loomis, of course, appealed his sentence and was referred to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. The Wisconsin Attorney General said that the Compass system, quote, has a role at sentencing and is individualized to each defendant. A Compass is an algorithm developed by a private company, North Point Incorporated, that calculates the likelihood of someone committing another crime and suggests what kind of supervision a defendant should receive in prison. The results come from a survey of the defendant and information about his or her past conduct and criminal history. Company officials say that the algorithm's results are backed by research, but they're very tight-lipped about its details. They do acknowledge that men and women receive different assessments, as do juveniles, but the factors considered and the weight given to each are kept completely secret. Jeffrey Harmon, North Point's general manager, said, quote, The key to our product is the algorithms, and they're proprietary. We've created them, and we don't release them because it's certainly a core piece of our business. It's not about looking at the algorithms. It's about looking at the outcomes. The secrecy is at the heart of Mr. Loomis's lawsuit. His lawyer, Michael D. Rosenberg, argued that Mr. Loomis should be able to review the algorithm and make arguments about its validity as part of his defense. He also challenges the use of different scales for each sex. In Wisconsin, Tristan Cook, a spokesman for the state's Department of Corrections, said compass scores were used to help with inmate classification and release planning and were also available to sentencing judges upon request. Now look, guys, I can see both sides to this issue. Using software calculations can take out human biases, even unknown biases that can occur during sentencing. This is a pretty common occurrence, unbelievably. My concern, though, is that this power is in the hands of a single company that is refusing to release any information on it. How do we know that untrue or faulty biases haven't made it into the algorithm of this software? We can't know, since the algorithms are tightly held. What I'd love to see in this process is competition in the market space. Surely at some point, some company would release their algorithms in an open-sourced way for research and public scrutiny to give them a leg up in the industry. 
I could absolutely see software like this used in private arbitration situations and to help private companies determine if they want to hire a former criminal or allow a former criminal onto their property. Whether that's going to end up working well or not remains to be seen. But only the free market can take care of it. In tortured to death news, Madison Jensen was allowed to dehydrate to death in a Utah jail as she begged for her life. Jensen, 21, had been battling with an opioid addiction before ending up in jail. Her opiate addiction had turned to a heroin addiction, and her behavior had zapped her family of any remaining energy or patience that they'd previously held. They called the police. What the actual fuck? This, my friends, is why you only call the police if you have no other choice. Jensen put in a medical request, stating that both she and her cellmate contracted a stomach bug and could not keep any water down. Days passed, with Jensen not receiving any medical treatment at all until... Finally, it happened. She was found dead in her jail cell, the result of a jail which didn't attempt to meet her physical or medical needs, according to the family. A Utah medical examiner's report classified the 21-year-old woman's death as, quote, natural, result of cardiac arrhythmia caused by opiate withdrawal and dehydration. According to the Salt Lake City Tribune, authorities have, quote, declined to release surveillance video that would show Jensen's care during her time in jail. The county attorney and the county sheriff's office each has declined to release records that would shed more light on Jensen's treatment. When Jensen went into prison, she weighed 130 pounds. The state's own medical examiner's initial report wrote that the nearly six feet tall woman weighed 87 pounds when she was found dead four days later. Medical examiners then later put her weight at 112 pounds. So she lost anywhere from 17 to 42 pounds in four days due to her illness and received no medical attention. And, you know, I tend to lean to this being closer to the 42 pounds, since that's what the initial report stated. There's only one way to look at this case. Jensen was tortured to death. She was allowed to slowly dehydrate due to not being able to keep down water and given no medical treatment for it. This sounds like something you would hear out of North Korea or Soviet Russia, not something you would hear from Utah. The people responsible for her at the time of her death should be held personally responsible for the inaction that resulted in her death. Thankfully, that might be the case in this situation. Her death is now being investigated as a potential crime, with charges to hopefully be brought against any irresponsible jail employee. The county attorney, Stephen Foote, is reviewing the case for possible criminal charges for jail staff. He said he would release a timeline of Jensen's time in jail, but likely would still prevent the release of video that would show what happened, saying that it's a matter of security. Yeah, securing the officers. In the meantime, Jerry Jansen, the woman's father, intends to sue the county, the county jail, and the staff. He said, quote, When she says she didn't eat or drink for four days and you still didn't put an IV in her arm, you drop the ball on her. I want everyone involved with her death removed from that jail, including the sheriff and the jail commander, so no other parent has to do this again. Now let's all hope that this lawsuit and criminal investigation makes some serious changes to the way inmates are handled in prisons around the country. Look, guys, I'm sure you know that student loan debt is at a collective $1.4 trillion, with 25% of graduates still struggling to find meaningful employment. Instead of being a statistic, you can choose to live life on your own terms and join the intellectually stimulating, collaborative community of Praxis. While getting a paid apprenticeship with a dynamic growing company, Praxis participants receive intensive professional development that they describe as, quote, freedom empowerment, creativity, progress, achievement, inspiring, and challenging that leads directly to a full-time job. To learn more about how you can ignite your future with this fire-starting collaborative community of Praxis, go to discoverpraxis.com slash lava. Coming up in the How to Live a Lava Lifestyle segment of this show, I'm going to tell you more about how Praxis can help you achieve your goals and even give you access to an exclusive 20-minute video from Praxis. In taking some teeth from the federal drug war news, Congress, once again, is blocking the Justice Department from spending any money that interferes with state medical marijuana laws. In their newly unveiled budget bill, lawmakers included a provision known as the Rohrabacher Far Amendment that allows states to carry on with crafting their own medical marijuana policies without fear of federal intervention. The bill, which funds the government through the end of September, is expected to pass this week. Here's the full text of the marijuana provision. 
quote, none of the funds made available in this act to the Department of Justice may be used with respect to any of the states of, and then it goes on to list all of the states that have medical marijuana laws, or with respect to the District of Columbia, Guam, or Puerto Rico to prevent any of them from implementing their own laws that authorize the use, distribution, possession, or cultivation of medical marijuana. Now, it's not unusual to find this tucked into a budget bill. Lawmakers have been renewing the medical marijuana provision in every consecutive budget since it first passed in 2014. But what it does show is that Congress isn't interested in stepping up federal oversight of state pot laws under the Trump administration, even as U.S. Attorney General Jeff Sessions hints that he wants a crackdown. Sessions issued an ominous warning in February to states with legalized marijuana, saying, quote, States, they can pass the laws they choose. I would just say that it does remain a violation of federal law to distribute marijuana throughout any place in the United States, whether a state legalizes it or not. Showing his cluelessness, he also has said that, quote, good people don't smoke marijuana and the pot is only, quote, slightly less awful than heroin. Jesus Christ, what an idiot. In theory, Sessions could still take action against states that have legalized recreational marijuana. Eight states in the District of Columbia have laws like this, and they're not shielded by the language in this budget bill. Hopefully, though, Sessions will take a hint from Congress that these laws are states' issues and should be ignored at the federal level. However, it's very likely that he will use whatever power he can to stop the devil's weed. In unfit-to-exist news, a Florida judge, someone who is supposed to uphold the protections of the Constitution, has granted a motion to compel two suspects in an ongoing case to reveal their smartphone passcodes to allow prosecutors to search for evidence related to an extortion allegedly carried out by a couple. It used to be that you could be compelled to give up your fingerprint to unlock your phone, but not your password or pin code. Other cases involving smartphone passcodes have set this precedent before. This latest update to the ongoing battle for password privacy brings us further down the slippery slope to having no privacy on our devices at all. Kurt Conzi, the attorney for one of the defendants ordered to give up a password, said, quote, They're asking for the passcode so they can keep on searching what's on the phone, which may be incriminating my client, and then use that against her. Zegja Bozniak, the attorney for the other defendant, said that her client doesn't even remember the password. Quote, at the end of the day, I know he won't be able to produce a password. You can't compel someone to say something that they don't have. What happens next? We'll see. Just don't be surprised if it takes a Supreme Court ruling to set the privacy record straight. And even then, I'd be surprised if it goes the right way. Josh Horowitz, a tech lawyer, told CNN, quote, This is definitely a question that is percolating in the lower courts and will eventually make its way up to the Supreme Court. Until it does, there's really no clear answer on this issue. Bullshit. There's an absolutely clear answer to this issue. It is privacy. Sadly, when even a judge is stepping all over the Constitution, it should be clear to everyone that Lysander Spooner was right when he said, quote, it has either authorized such a government as we have had or has been powerless to prevent it. In either case, it is unfit to exist. This is why you can't put faith in a piece of paper. Exercise your free market muscles by going to the lavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a buck an episode or use Bitcoin. Get exclusive content, rewards, and help the lava flow become fiscally neutral while providing you more content. The lavaflow.com slash support. Talk the talk. Do you walk the walk? As you guys know, Jessica and I chose a very non-traditional avenue to educate our kids, going with unschooling. There are tons of benefits to this style of education, and I will surely get into those one day on this podcast. But one downside it has, if you want to call it a downside, is that it does not prepare our children for traditional education styles, like sitting in class, taking notes, memorizing lectures, etc., This means a traditional college education may not be right for my boys, and I'm okay with that, especially coming from the perspective that I put myself in massive school debt for very little gain by going to college. I don't want my kids saddled with this. So what opportunities has the free market given us to solve this problem? One that I've been watching for a while now is Praxis. So you can imagine my surprise and delight when Praxis approached me about sponsoring this show. Jess and I had already decided to look heavily at Praxis months ago for our children's future prior to them contacting me, because it is such an amazing product. So what exactly is Praxis? 
It's an apprenticeship boot camp on steroids, getting your foot in the door at startup companies with paying jobs that actually teach you marketable skills that will follow you for the rest of your life. It's that simple. The program starts with an intensive three-month pre-apprenticeship boot camp that prepares you to get the most out of your apprenticeship and accelerates your professional development. In this boot camp, you start building your personal brand, receiving specific training for your apprenticeship, and you work one-on-one with a program advisor. After that, you'll apprentice full-time at a successful startup and continue your education experience. You'll shadow founders and CEOs, complete self-directed projects, receive one-on-one professional coaching, and develop transferable skills and experiences that you can take anywhere. At the end of nine months, Praxis participants are in the top 1% of young professionals. Graduates receive a full-time offer from their business partner. Some accept the offer. Others find another opportunity in the Praxis network or even start their own company. All graduates leave the program fully equipped for a fulfilling life and career. The average salary, average, is $50,000 per year with a graduate employment rate of 98%. And Praxis business partners are guaranteeing a full-time job offer of a minimum of $40,000. Wow! Compare this rate to the underemployment rate of college grads at 12.6% and an unemployment rate of 5.6%. Underemployment basically means that these kids put themselves through college and can't get a job that pays what their degree says they should make. A lot of times they're in retail or waiting tables instead of doing what their degree says they should be doing. Guys, this is huge. And you can go to Praxis basically for free. Did I just say free? (laughs) Yeah, I did. The full program cost is $12,000 for the nine-month course, and payment options are available. But participants earn $14,400 during their apprenticeship. This means that you'll make more money during the program than the program costs. And for this, you get at least two years' worth of experience crammed into less than a year and a great-paying job when you graduate, and no college debt which has averaged $37,000 per college student in 2016 when they finally graduate in five years. What's not to love about the Praxis Advantage? Absolutely nothing. Now, Praxis is a dream come true in the free market of college education and one that everybody should be taking a closer look at. So you could be helping to close six-figure deals, launching full-scale marketing campaigns, traveling with executives to conferences, overseeing the hiring of new staff, establishing new sales processes, overseeing the deployment of new products, or assisting in new fundraising rounds. Or you could be sitting in class with 50 other students memorizing the periodic table. Which would you rather have? Of course. So you've got to go to Praxis and check it out at discoverpraxis.com slash lava. Make sure to add the slash lava at the end to get an exclusive 20-minute free video. And yes, all of the activities that I mentioned a couple of sentences ago are, are activities that Praxis participants have actually taken part in. I shit you not. So when I decided to take on sponsors for this show, I decided right away that I would only bring you sponsors that offer value to you, not to me. I could be spouting the same advertising of Audible.com and Harry's Razors, but you've heard those a thousand times, and you know all about them. I wanted to bring you guys value, or I'm not going to take a sponsor. Praxis will bring you and your kids value. Check them out at discoverpraxis.com slash lava to get started today and to get your free exclusive 20-minute video module from Praxis called The Value Creation Mindset. It's one of the most valuable lessons from week one of the Praxis program taught by Praxis CEO Isaac Morehouse. This module is awesome for anyone, whether you're looking for a job, looking for college education options, or if you've been employed for 30 years. Trust me, you want to take the 20 minutes to watch this important video. I watched it, and I found a ton of value in it for me as an employee and a business owner. All you have to do is give them your email address, and you're on your way. That's discoverpraxis.com slash lava. And Praxis is spelled P-R-A-X-I-S. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half-wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. So, as you guys know, Porkfest is rapidly approaching. It's scheduled for Wednesday, June 21st through Sunday, June 25th of this year. If you've never been to a Porkfest event, it is the one libertarian event of the year that you really don't want to miss. And if you keep listening, I'll give you and a partner of your choice a chance to go to Porkfest for free this year on me. 
And I'm about to reveal some exclusive information to you guys. The full list of speakers for the main pavilion at Porkfest. Unfortunately, a big name was initially on this list, John McAfee, but he had to drop out because he's being required to be in Europe for his company that week. He says he's going to make it next year, though, so we'll see. While it certainly did bum me out, we will have an even better tech guy coming to the main pavilion to speak, and he's going to do a hands-on event right after his speech that you don't want to miss. Brian Sovereign of the Sovereign Tech Podcast will be speaking on personal internet security and then offering a free hands-on class following his speech where you can bring your personal internet devices to learn how to make them more secure. Guys, you have no idea how excited I am about this one. I've been listening to his podcast for years, long before I moved up here, and getting the chance to spend some quality time with this guy is what makes Porkfest what it is. Definitely make sure to go to the hands-on portion because I'm probably going to be helping him out during that event. Porkfest is, in a word, anarchy in action, where you will meet some of the best friends you will ever have in your life and get to hang out with the libertarian names that you've always heard about and followed. There is no event quite like Porkfest that I've ever been to. For example, even though you won't get to meet John McAfee, his vice presidential running mate, Judd Weiss, will be there this year giving a workshop. Now, if you don't know who Judd is, he is the premier photographer at libertarian events. He's also the guy who was behind those awesome videos for the McAfee campaign. Now, his photography is just incredible, and you will have a chance to learn his secrets to great photography at Porkfest, where he's going to be teaching a full-day workshop on his art. If you have any interest in photography at all, you are not going to be able to miss this. If you have any interest in photography at all, you have got to be there for this. It's going to be on Thursday, June 22nd. Another speaker that I'm most excited about is Lynn Ulbricht, mother of alleged dread pirate Roberts Ross Ulbricht. I was able to meet and have dinner with Lynn at Liberty Forum this past year, and it was just incredible. The lady is the epitome of someone who is a mother bear. She is kind and gentle and loving, but don't fuck with her kid. (laughs) She actually reminds me a lot of my own mother, to be honest. Other notable speakers will be Matt Kibbe from Free the People, who will be speaking on, quote, how to turn on the Liberty Curious. Uh, Patrick Byrne, CEO of Overstock.com, will be giving the keynote speech this year. Um, There's going to be speakers from Reason Magazine and Cato. Connor Boyack, writer of the Tuttle Twins books, is going to be speaking. Matt Carano will be speaking for Swarm City, the company that took over where Arcade City screwed up. Uh, James Davis from Camp Stomping Ground will be speaking on trusting young people. Mark Warden from Porcupine Real Estate will be speaking on real estate trends in New Hampshire. And of course, Jeffrey Tucker will be there and he'll be speaking twice. Will Coley will also be there, and he'll be speaking on Just Follow the Law, the Truth About Immigration Legalization, and Reading as a Critical Skill, the Lost Art of Learning. Another thing I'm really excited about is Jason Sorens, the founder and president of the Free State Project, will be doing nightly debates at the Pavilion, and they sound like a lot of fun. Dale Brown from the Detroit Threat Management Center will be talking on their non-lethal and violence as a last resort way of managing threats. This guy is awesome to listen to. And another one that I'm also very excited about is Derek McGill from Praxis, who's going to be speaking twice at the event. One of his speeches will be on liberty without self, how activism and politics can hold us back. And his other one will be called Criticize by Creating, Changing Higher Education Without Reform. And of course, as you guys are hearing on this episode, Praxis is a new sponsor for the Lava Flow podcast and a company that I truly believe in. So I'm super excited to meet Derek, hang out with him a bit, and see him speak. There's also going to be a few other speakers as well, so make sure to keep an eye out for the schedule. You can get it at porkfest.com slash schedule. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, you have a chance to win two free general admission tickets to Porkfest, courtesy of the Lava Flow podcast. Now guys, this is a $160 value. To enter this contest is super easy. Take a screenshot from your phone, tablet, or computer showing that you're subscribed to the Lava Flow from any podcatcher at all, iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Podcast, whatever the case may be. And email that screenshot to subscribed at thelavaflow.com, and you're going to be entered. To make sure that I don't miss the email, please put in the subject field, subscribed. That'll help me out a lot. If you've already subscribed to the show, awesome. This is going to be super easy for you. Just screenshot it and send it to subscribed at thelavaflow.com. If you've never subscribed, make sure to do so now and email me that screenshot. Subscribers help with the ranking of the show in iTunes and most other podcatchers, and it helps make sure that you never miss an episode of the show. So make sure to email me your screenshots today to subscribed at thelavaflow.com with the email subject of subscribed. Easy enough. 
So this contest will end in two weeks from this episode's release on Tuesday, May 23rd, the day of the next Lava Flow episode. So make sure to get your entries in ASAP. The winner will be randomly drawn and notified right away, so you can make all the plans needed to come hang out with me and more than a thousand other libertarians in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Thank you for listening to the show this week. As always, I need to thank my favorite, Porkfest, and Free Coast Free Cast organizer, Jessica, for her help with this show. For the show notes to this episode, where I put links and other information that's been on this show, go to thelavaflow.com slash 61. I have no new iTunes reviews this week, sadly. Now, iTunes helps to steer people to this podcast based on ratings and reviews, so please go to thelavaflow.com slash iTunes and leave me a rating and a review. Thank you to everybody who's left me a rating and review so far. You guys are the best. Can you guys help me out and go leave a review for me? Go to thelavaflow.com slash iTunes to do that now. And I have two new donors to the show. Andrew gave a one-time $2.50 donation to the show. Thanks so much, Andrew. And Chris gave a huge Bitcoin donation of $130 to cover a yearly support. Chris, thank you so, so much. Chris also gave the same amount to one of our other shows, Resist the Empire. I mean, that is just huge. Chris, it's so much appreciated. I can't thank you enough. Thanks to Andrew, Chris, and all of my other awesome supporters, I'm now at $194.50 per episode, or 77.8% of the way towards my next goal of $250. Thanks, guys. You rock. And if you, like Andrew and Chris, want more of the Lava Flow, exercise your free market muscles by going to thelavaflow.com slash support and giving a per episode donation of as little as a bucket episode using Federal Reserve notes through Patreon or Bitcoin through Coinbase. I want to be able to bring you more content very soon, so make sure to add your donation today to help make that happen. Until next time, keep striking the root. Thank you for listening to The Lava Flow at thelavaflow.com. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe now at thelavaflow.com forward slash subscribe. This has been a Pax Libertas Productions podcast. <laughs>